Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's lovely to see you all today. Welcome to worship and also to those people that may be joining us online. Uh, a little change to the service this morning because, as most of you will realise, Patricia Fuller uh, was to take our service this morning. Uh, I mean, she's not been very well during the week and has been told to rest. So uh, that's what she's doing. And uh, she had, being Patricia, written the service out in full and she wanted it to be used. So we're very grateful for Hannah, who's taken that on. So the words will be Patricia's, but they will be delivered by uh, Hannah. There were in the wilderness of Lent, where the silence deafens and the solitude shouts, a saviour waits to bring us home. Oh, oh, oh. Give the Lord the honour due unto his name. Worship the Lord with holy worship. Unto thee, O Lord, do we lift up our souls. O God, we trust in thee. We begin our worship with, come now is the time to worship, singing the faith the 24. Thank you. every mouth of confession from every creature is your glorious name O God Father Son and Holy Spirit for you created the world by the word of your power and in love you most wonderfully redeemed it we give you thanks for meeting us where we are we give you thanks for all our material benefits we give you thanks for the beauties of the natural world and for the ingenuity of humankind as we look more deeply into your creation. 
as we consider our actions of the past week, we remember that some of our words and deeds have shown anger, dislike, rudeness, and we are sorry. We ask for your forgiveness, knowing that your love is unconditional. So, look graciously upon us, loving Father, <clears throat> And give us for our hallowing thoughts which pass into prayer, prayers which pass into love, and love which passes into life with Christ forever. Amen. Um, so the, uh, the next section of the service Patricia is labelled young people. Um, and I have to say she hasn't actually written what she was going to say. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, this is no, no offence to her because, of course, she didn't know that someone else was going to be reading it when she read it. So, uh, I've had a quick chat with Daniel and, um, uh, oh, Daniel's father, whose name is totally, Richard, sorry, um, <laughs> totally blank. Um, and, I, and I think I know roughly where we're going, but who knows, um, and it might not be very long. Uh, so it says, Patricia's written in brackets, begin with Tracy and her view of church needing pews. So I'm assuming there's a story about someone called Tracy who thinks that a church needs pews. Um, does God need pews? No. No, no. Oh, well, we'll see, we, we might be at the answer already, so you know, it might not take very long. Um, and I think, the reason I talked to Daniel and Matthew, uh, uh, Daniel and Richard, sorry, um, is because uh, Patricia, I was aware, had asked Daniel to prepare some pictures for us. So I think uh, we've got some pictures. Um, can you share them on Zoom so that I can see them too? <laughs> That'd be great. Um, so um, what, what have we got in these pictures then? Anyone want to shout out? Can you see anything that you recognise? Daniel's chosen them, so he, he can't answer. The chapel, yeah, top left. A golf course, yes, I'm sorry, I'm a bit close. London? London, yes, is it London specific? Uh, specifically Trafalgar Square, I think I was told earlier, yeah? Top right, is that the King's Cross or St Pancras? Top right, King's Cross or St Pancras? Just a railway station. All right, well, we were, Steve Darby was trying to be more, more precise there. Um, uh, Lily? A valley, yes. Mountains and valleys. Um, <laughs> Robert said, that, in case you didn't hear him, the lounge in the manse at the top of the middle. Is that what the lounge in the manse looks like? Yeah, apparently so. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, can anyone uh, hazard a guess as to, I mean, as much as my guess is, what Patricia wanted us to think by asking Daniel to put some pictures together? Oh, Anna, Anna's going to give it a go. I actually know what Patricia Oh, oh! <laughs> oh, I, I should have actually asked you that. I was thinking, because you're, um, I'm right in thinking that we're in the middle of the Lent series. Um, I'm standing here with no knowledge of what the actual series is, but Anna, I, I believe the young people are doing some stuff downstairs that links in, so you're probably going to know, right? I think Patricia was thinking about where God lives. Where does God live? Yeah. What I've written down from my conversation with Richard was, we can pray anywhere. Yeah. We can where be with God possible? anywhere. Does that sound like a good message for all of us, not just for the young people? I think it does, doesn't it? Oh. That's what I've got. <laughs> and I wanna, do you want to add anything else? Are you going to save that for your time downstairs? So um, I'm guessing that as we sing the next song, you probably want to go downstairs and, and explore that with the young people. And we're going to explore it in a different way upstairs, presumably. Um, well, we will. Um, uh, so the next song is um, uh, Mission Praise 307, I Will Enter His Gates. Uh, but let's just pray for the young people so they can leave whenever they're ready. Lord, thank you that we can be with you wherever we are, wherever you are. God is all around us and we can worship you 
and talk to you in those places. Amen. Amen. So let's sing together, I will enter his gates. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he, he and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did and heard the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out to the city, to Bethany, where he spent the night. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to sing again, uh, I'm just checking I've got the right hymn, um, uh, 247, How Lovely Is Thy Dwelling Place, uh, which is from Psalm 84, which is one of the psalms for today, so we're not having a second reading, we're just uh, having this version of the psalm to sing together. So, thank you.
Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, these are Patricia's words. The picture of Jesus clearing out the myriad stools in the court of the Gentiles at the temple always sounds a bit shocking. Try to imagine, if you can, one of our past ministers, I'm going to name Robert here, throwing out the tables and their contents at one of our marmalade sales <laughs> or our bacon coffee mornings. It doesn't really work, does it? Why not, says Patricia. With those marmalade sales and other events, we have been quite clear about the purpose. The funds raised are for this church, or they are for a named cause. No one within the church leadership team will benefit personally from the marmalade sales or the baking parties. I don't know, maybe my tummy will benefit. <laughs> for instance, it is thought highly likely that some members of the temple hierarchy had a financial interest in individual tables. The bazaars of Anna's sold doves for sacrifice, for sacrifice and were the private property of the family of the high priest of that name. The makers of the preserves and handicrafts give the products of their labour whilst the temple storeholders were business people whose aim was profit. Profit is important, but perhaps not when it amounts to a markup of 100% on the price of sacrificial victims over, whose, uh, over those bought outside the temple precincts. You may also imagine the checking of the creatures to ensure their perfection, especially when bought elsewhere. So long as the money used at the marmalade sales was British currency, no one was fussed. Individual stallholders did occasionally feel slightly peeved when a £20 note was handed over for the purchase of a £1.25 jar of marmalade, with exact change expected or else. <laughs> Coinage uh, did matter at the temple. If you didn't have the correct coins, coins with the head of a ruler, which might equal idolatry, the money needed to be changed. And of course, there was a charge. Following this, I can say, and this is still Patricia, remember, I can say that our treasurer does not round up members of Castle Carey Methodist Church and firmly request that they pay a specific amount as, as a tax. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> the Jews at the time did pay an annual amount, and if they did not have the correct coins, then there was a charge for organising the giving of change. Uh, in brackets, Patricia has written, Europe and some other countries levying a small amount to pay for the church, uh, usually Lutheran. Jesus' description of the temple having become a den of thieves works, and we have some understanding as to why he acted as he did. At this point, there are several directions in which we might go. We could follow junior church and consider righteous anger. What is it? Does it exist? And when should it be used? Or because we often see the season of Lent as a personal spiritual journey. We could look at ourselves and decide upon a spring cleaning of the soul. The Methodist Lent course uh, covered this in its own way uh, when the Monday evening Bible study group met last Monday. Um, I'll just add in that we're the, uh, our online home group is following the Methodist Unbounded Love uh, ser series this Lent, um, which you can receive by email um, daily from the Methodist Church if you're interested. However, Patricia says, the words which struck her when she read of the incident in Mark, as opposed to Matthew, 
were, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, from Isaiah 56. But we will start with the temple and Castle Kerry Methodist Church being houses of prayer. Well, really, all churches being houses of prayer. So what is our building for? Well, we've been praying this morning. Sometimes, mostly I hope, the preacher uses language that we can all pray with. But it isn't just the preacher who is talking. It's every one of us. And it might even be when the leader is talking. Our church is where we are able to pray together. And when appropriate, to know that we are battering the gates of heaven unitedly. We are able to see each other, and on occasion, we feel a strong urge to pray for X in front of us, Y behind us, or Z who is at the lectern. We also enjoy praising the Lord with music and song. We might be energized in our walk with Jesus, or we might be calmed in our difficulties, or we might well receive a better understanding of scripture than the speaker has given. Then there is the teaching that is on offer. When we go home thinking that at last we understand what that passage means, or disagreeing with the preacher and having to sort out in our own minds as to why. Sometimes our hearts and minds are changed. We have taken a noticeable step forward in our faith. All these things are right and proper and fulfil the first part of our church's tagline or strapline. Our purpose is to worship God. The corporate praying, music and the speaking and listening have helped us to do that this morning and other, in other worship services. Can we now go home and tick off Sunday morning and our obligations to our Father? I don't think so. Not because the Lord doesn't value our worship, but because we have been commanded to go and we have added to our strapline and to make his love known. What was the purpose of the temple? Worship was there, but it was graded worship. Gentile tourists could only go as far as the court of the Gentiles. Women only as far as the court of the women. Ordinary men to the court of the Israelites. Priests to the court of the priests. And finally, the behind the veil, the Holy of Holies, where only the high priests ventured on the Day of Atonement. It is difficult to say that family was celebrated because it could not stay together if the men wanted to go further. I don't think we can say that the temple supported the everyday community. It was more a symbol for the Israelites. And yes, we do need symbols for the purpose of encouragement and identity. Think of St Paul's Cathedral during the Blitz and Coventry Cathedral today. Is this what we want for the churches we attend? How does being a symbol make God's love known? Perhaps our churches are a supportive base for sharing that love. Patricia asked a friend what churches were for and his immediate answer was as a center for the community to gather. He had been a choir boy, so I think he took the worship for granted. Yesterday in our building, the repair cafe met and mended items downstairs. I understand that a visitor last month said, ah, community, I understand. Then yesterday afternoon, the library, run by a volunteer group, had a gathering here in our building for, the, for a competition it had run. Last Monday was lunch club, and Patricia says there were no complaints from her table. This coming Monday, the afternoon group will likely to be, uh, is likely to be the knitters. Monday evening, the choir will rehearse. 
Tuesday morning we'll see the toddlers and Wednesday morning will be coffee for all. No, these are not all Christian groups, let alone having good Methodist leadership. But there are worshipping Christians in the makeup of the organisations. Some of them are members. Each person in their words and actions is making God's love known in practice. They are acting as the sheep did in the story of the sheep and the goats. What wonderful seed sowing and soon the group members will be here on a Sunday. Not not necessarily. Some seeds take their time to germinate. This winter, after 30 years, Patricia has discovered violets growing in her so-called lawn. She says she didn't put them there. The important thing is that the seeds were sown. Then there is the reason for using the verse from Mark's recounting of all the cleansing of the temple, where the writer adds that this house of prayer is for all nations. When we read of the coming of the Holy Spirit in the Acts of the Apostles, there is a lengthy list of the areas from which Jews had traveled for the festive season. They were not just Israelites. However wrong I am, I suspect that the men at least could venture into the temple as far as the indigenous population. No doubt someone will correct me if necessary. So I'm thinking that this is a small positive for the temple. Perhaps the wording should be for all people. There are Christian organisations which discriminate. We don't really approve of women in the pulpit or in senior roles. You must attend classes and complete the course to become a member here. And the more subtle discrimination through forms of worship. <clears throat> Patricia says she enjoys the authorised version of the Bible and feels comforted by traditional evening song. And also felt a proper part of Colin's Holy Communion service the other week. The number of people who feel disqualified from attending their local church might not be vast, but it is, it does, they do exist. In Oxfordshire, Patricia gave up going on, uh, going on Mothering Sunday. It's right and proper to celebrate motherhood, but to do so in such a way as to make single people feel unwanted, if not wrong, well, that's how she felt. And while our buildings, uh, and while our buildings, people might protect certain areas for health and safety reasons, any lo locked doors are for security, not discrimination. If we did a thorough review of where we are now as the body of Christ, what would our answers be to the following questions? Is our church a house of prayer? Is it a house of prayer for all who enter? Are we able to subscribe to the statement, our purpose is to worship God and make his love known? Lord God, as your people, we ask that the Holy Spirit so works in our hearts that we share the love of our Saviour Jesus with all whom we meet. Amen. Amen. So I hope you are able to follow Patricia's words um, and we'll uh, reflect on those as we sing. There's a wideness in God's mercy, singing the faith for one sin.
And can we take up the offering for the work of God in this place? Thank you, God, for the gifts that we give in money, in time and love. Amen. And now uh, Steve Baker is going to come and lead uh, our prayers. So with our uh, prayers this morning, we have a response. So when I pray, Lord of all, please could you respond, hear our prayer. Lord of all, hear our prayer. I was uh, reminded as I was preparing uh, about the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, a woman who would have been uh, excluded and almost certainly kept out of the temple uh, by her gender and probably her race as well. And when Jesus met her, he said to her, uh, amongst other things, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So let's pray. Almighty and all loving God, we long to worship you in this place and in every place, to offer to you our praise and reverence, to proclaim your greatness, to acknowledge your power, to recognize your sovereignty, and to declare your goodness. Lord of all, hear our prayer. Compassionate and caring God, we pray that in this place and in every place, our hearts will be filled with gratitude for your love that constantly surrounds us, for all the blessings of our lives, for the wonder of our world, and for the hope of our faith in Christ. Lord of all, hear our prayer. Merciful and forgiving God, we come to meet you knowing that this week we have let you down when we have not loved you with all our heart or loved each other as we should. We confess that we have failed to appreciate your many gifts and we have broken your commandments. We pray that in this place and in every place we may know your love and forgiveness. Lord of all, hear our prayer. Living and life-giving God, in faith and trust, we come to petition, to petition you to pray for ourselves, for one another, and for our world, to bring the concerns of our daily lives before you, to bring our loved ones into your presence. We pray particularly this morning for Patricia and for Jessica Chalmers and Ken and Louise. And in a moment of silence, we lift those known to us who are also known to you. We do so in this place and in every place. Lord of all, hear our prayer. Global God, we pray for the work of our mission partner, Open Doors. This week, we're asked to, to pray for Leah. In, I in Nigeria, Leah was among more than 100 girls abducted from their school on the 19th of February, 2018. Tragically, one of the girls died in captivity. All the others were released within a month, except Leah, because she refused to deny her faith in Jesus. We pray, continue to pray, that the day will arrive very soon when Leah will be reunited with her family and discover just what an inspiration she has been to so many people. And we pray for the thousands of other young Nigerian women who have been abducted, just like Leah, whose names we do not know. Lord of all, hear our prayer. 
so God incarnate, as we prepare to leave this place and to go into the world, we offer you our worship, our praise, our thanksgiving, our confession, our petition, and the world. Respond to us, we pray, and respond to all who encounter you in this place and in every place. Touch our hearts with your living presence. Fill our lives with your grace, so that our love for you may grow, our faith be deepened, and our service strengthened. Lord of all, hear our prayer. And in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray, we, te we, we pray the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Um, our final song is uh, Let Us Build a House, Singing the Faith, number 409.
worship has not ended. It has only just begun. For God is with us every moment of every day. Let us go and offer the worship he desires. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with him every step along our way. Amen. Amen.